Good morning. Let's begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your grace to us in Christ. We thank you that we have a high priest who is always at your right hand, interceding for us. And we thank you for the hope that we have, not only in this life, but in the world to come. We pray that your spirit will lead us as we study your word this morning, and we ask for your uh, grace in Christ's name. Amen. Our text this morning again comes from Hebrews chapter 7, verses uh, 11 and following. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arrive after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one name uh, after Aaron? For when there's a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it's evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with the tribe, uh, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not according to a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it's witness of him, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Thus is the reading of God's holy and an errant word. We're continuing our study uh, in Hebrews this morning about the priesthood of Christ and the law that accompanies his priesthood. As a reminder, uh, we're looking at the thing that got Stephen stoned and got Paul in, uh, arrested uh, when he was in Jerusalem. Both of these men were accused of speaking against the temple and against the law. The book of Acts doesn't really tell us what they said against the temple and against the law, but our book does, the book of Hebrews does. Uh, we find uh, in Hebrews that with the life, death, uh, uh, and resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, that God appoints a new kind of priest to replace that priesthood that was found in the Old Testament, the priesthood of Aaron. And Jesus isn't just a better type of priest in Aaron's lineage. Hebrews tells us uh, he is a different kind of priest. He's better in this way. He's, he's a different kind. He's after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, it, uh, the priesthood of Christ is also eternal. Uh, he, he, the, the ironic priests in the Old Testament, they, they died and had to be replaced. With Christ, this, uh, he is an eternal high priest. He also has a continual presence before God's throne of grace. In the Old Testament, the priest could only come at certain times, but with Christ as our high priest, he is always present uh, at, at God's throne. Christ also as our high priest is dedicated to mediating for us and solely for us. Uh, in the Old Testament, he, the, the priests had to deal with their sins before they could ever deal with the people's sins. Christ has dealt um, uh, with, he deals only with our sins. He has no sins of his own to deal with. It's a, it's a dedicated priesthood, that, that, uh, and a dedicated priest. Um, Christ also uh, made uh, his sacrifice once and for all. Uh, and he got the job done. He's able to present us to the Father in such a way that our sins are completely and justly washed away so that the Father can uh, no longer remembers our sins. They, they are, they're completely done away with. And uh, with such a, a disposal of our sins, our conscience is clear. Uh, and we are no longer guilty, and we can draw near to God's throne of grace with a boldness and a confidence that the people in the Old Testament, Old Testament time didn't have. All, all of that is on account of Christ as our high priest. Uh, but it's not just that in Christ that we have a new priest. Our text tells us, and we saw this last week, that with this new priesthood, there also comes a new law. Each priesthood had a set of laws that govern the priest and govern the people. Um, and when there's a change in the priesthood, there's also a change in the law as well. That's what Hebrews 7, 12 says. And so when the Old Testament priesthood was made obsolete, so was, it, so was its law, the Mosaic law. When the new priesthood of Jesus Christ is inaugurated, with it comes a new law. Paul calls this new law the law of Christ. Now I think that we all understand that there are certain aspects of the Old Testament law, the ceremonial law, that is, that are, is clearly gone. 
the animal sacrifices, the Day of Atonement, the priestly descent, and uh, the, the rise and fall of, of, of priests and all that sort of stuff it, it's, uh, through their death, that's, that's all gone. But what do we do with the moral law that's found in, in uh, the book of Moses? Um, the, the law, that, the Ten Commandments, uh, you should have no other gods, don't, uh, no idols, don't take God's name in vain, the Sabbath, honor your par parents, kill, steal, commit adultery, bear false witness, and covet. What do we do with, what happens to uh, those laws? What happens to Leviticus 19 where it says, love your neighbor? Or Deuteronomy 6, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Uh, what happens to that old covenant that God made with Moses and the people there at uh, the Mount, uh, at, at Mount Sinai, the, the moral law and the ceremonial law? What happens to that? Well, here's what our text says. It says where there's a change in the priesthood, there's also a change in the law. The Mosaic law, in, in all of its aspects, ceremonial and moral, had to be changed. A new kind of law, like a new kind of priesthood, is necessary. Perfection under the old priesthood and perfection under the old law was not attainable. Um, a, new, a new covenant uh, had to be made with a new priest and, and new law. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The old covenant uh, had to be abolished. That's a word that's used in Hebrews. Abrogated, set aside, because it, as we saw at the end of our text, that, that old covenant with its laws were weak and useless. A new priesthood and a new law, one in which there is a better hope introduced um, and, and one that will allow us to draw near to God needed to be put into force. And that's what Christ did on the night of his uh, betrayal uh, as he broke bread. And that's what we have when we come to the book of Hebrews. He's talking about this new covenant, this, this, this new priesthood, or this new law uh, that we have. So the question this morning is this. What is this new law? What is the law of Christ? Well, let's begin with his location. Where do we find this new law? Well, the old law, the Mosaic law, was written on tablets of stone. It was found on scrolls. It was found uh, on people's doorposts as they walked out the door. That's what that law said. They, they wrote it on their hands, and they, they uh, wore it between their eyes. And, and, that, and literally, that's what they did. Uh, when the people returned back from captivity in Babylon, they put little boxes that had the law in it between their eyes, and they, and they wrote, it on their, wrote it on their arms. Um, it was... Uh, it was uh, external uh, to them. Uh, the, Mo the Mosaic Law was a code that you could look out at and see. Uh, it, was, it was external. The writing on the doorposts and, and on the hands and on the eye and, and uh, in the box between the eyes, all that was symbolic. It all pointed to something greater. But in the Old Testament times, it pointed to something that was not yet there. But in this new law that we have, this law of Christ, which the Old Testament law pointed to in this new law that we have with Christ, that which the Old Testament pointed to has now arrived. This new law, the law of Christ, we, we can see it in Hebrews 8 as the author quotes Jeremiah 31. He talks about how this law will no longer be external to us. Instead, God says he will write, in Hebrews 8.10, I will write my laws on their minds and in their hearts. Uh, that's, that's what God's going to do. He's going to place it internally within us. One of the things that happens when we come to faith in Christ is that we learn that God has called us to himself. His Holy Spirit has come into our life and caused us to be born anew or born again, 1 Peter chapter 3. And then uh, the, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We're, we're made, we're a, we are a new creation. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 says. And uh, one aspect of this newness is that God's Holy Spirit dwells in us and God's Holy Spirit leads us. He convicts us of our sin and then he leads us in our life. We don't have to look to an external code to tell us what's right and wrong or what's holy and what's unholy. God's Holy Spirit speaks to us and we know from within our heart and minds what's right and what's wrong. How many of you all have uh, recently had to look at an external code or a copy of the Ten Commandments to find out if it's okay to commit adultery or steal or bear false witness. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't have to do that. If you're a believer in Christ, God has put 
his Holy Spirit within you and he's written his laws on your hearts and your minds and so you know from within what to do. You don't have to look to an external code. And then Paul says we also know what not to do. In Galatians chapter 5, 19, he says the works of the flesh are obvious. They're plain. Um, when's the last time you picked up the phone and called the preacher and said, hey preacher, it's Friday night and I'm thinking about going out and carousing a little bit and getting drunk and getting involved in some fornication. Uh, none of us have to do any of that sort of thing. If, you know, if you're a Christian, you already know the answers to those things. The Holy Spirit informs us. The law of God is written on our heart and our minds and it's plain to us the things that we're not to do. So what is that law that's written on our heart and put into our mind? Well, we read in Hebrews 8.10 where God says, I will put my law into their heart and minds. The moral law under the priesthood of Jesus is not materially any different than that which we find in the Old Testament Ten Commandments in Leviticus 19, love your neighbor, and Deuteronomy 6, love God. Paul still tells us as we are under this new covenant that we are not to, to uh, uh, steal, that we are to honor our parents, that we are not to commit adultery. Um, he, he tells us all of those things in, in Ephesians 5 and, and in uh, uh, Colossians chapter 3. Uh, under this new uh, law of Christ, we're set free from the yoke of the law, Galatians 5, 1. We're set free from that external code, but we're not lawless. And we're not the ones that make up the laws. God tells us he will put his law in our hearts and minds. We're free from the constraints of a law that's external to us. We now have the Holy Spirit speaking to our new nature and we have a new disposition to the Lord. Internally, we have been changed. Prior to coming to Christ, we were hostile to God because we were sinners. We were not holy and we were unable to, to stand before God and we knew that because of the great difference between us. But now that we have come to faith in Christ, um, we, all of that has changed and it's changed because God changed it in Christ God takes away our sins and he cleanses us he cleanses our conscience so that we're able to draw near to him without fear uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and so when the Holy Spirit speaks the law of Christ to our heart and to our mind it's not speaking to a heart that's, that's first response is to rebel because we can't keep it we know now that we can't keep the law and we also know that there's forgiveness in Christ and God remembers our sins no more. That's part of the better hope that our author speaks of in Hebrews chapter 7, 19. So when the Holy Spirit speaks God's law to us, it's not met with rebellion. It's met with a, with a different attitude. And that brings us uh, to, a, to another aspect of this new law that the old law didn't have. And that's this. There is a power in the law of Christ that the law of Moses did not have. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to a heart that has been thoroughly cleansed and made right with the Lord. Imagine for a moment that you, a parent who um, has a child and that child lied to the parent one time. But every time the child wants to do something or, or, or ask for anything, the parent calls that child a liar and, and recalls that lie that that child told to the parent. Uh, what effect is that going to have upon the child? Uh, if, um, uh, if he's designated a liar no matter what he does, what incentive is that for him to tell the truth? His, his, his parents content, uh, w are going to consider him to be a liar no matter, wh no matter what he does. Well that's what the law apart from Christ does to us. It's a constant reminder to us that we're lawbreakers that we're sinners, that we stand condemned, and that we have no place before God on account of our guilt and our shame. And here's where the gospel of the power, uh, here's where the power of the gospel comes into play. In Christ, our sins are forgiven, and we are no longer in a state of condemnation before the Lord. God doesn't hold our sins against us. Um, the law can no longer condemn us for our sins, and tell us each and every day that we are condemned because Christ Jesus has dealt with our sin and there's no more condemnation uh, before God on account of our sins. Our conscience is clear of all that guilt. We're forgiven and acceptable in God's sight and we can draw near to him.
And so when the Holy Spirit speaks God's word to our heart and to our mind, when, when God's law that's written on our heart directs us what to do, it's not met so much with resistance, but with thankfulness. And with this thankfulness and with this gratitude comes a new power, and that's a power to obey God uh, and obey God's uh, direction to us. We hear our, fellow, our Heavenly Father speak to us of our forgiveness and His love to us. And He calls us um, when we sin to seek His forgiveness and then He forgives us and we are clean. Now, the power to obey the law is not found in the law of Moses. It's found in the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The law of Christ is a different kind of law. The content, what's right and wrong, there's no material difference. But the power that comes with the law of Christ, there's a vast difference. Uh, it, it comes from within and it speaks to a clean heart and not a rebellious one. There's another aspect of the law of Christ that has a greater emphasis than what we find in the law of Moses, and that's love. Uh, love God and love your neighbors. Uh, we find that in the Old Testament. I uh, uh, mentioned it just a few moments ago, Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy 6. We find that there in, in Moses' law. Uh, it's, it's external. Um, and, and, that, and that law of Moses did point to, it, it pointed to internal things, but it was, but it was external. And, and in Jesus' day, the people um, sought to apply it externally. And, and Jesus dealt with them about that. In one story, the story of the Good Samaritan, a lawyer comes up to Jesus and he asks um, what he has to do to, to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says, tell me what's in the law. And the, the lawyer answers correctly. He says, love God and love your neighbor. And then the, neighbor, the, the lawyer wanted to try to narrow that down a little bit. And so he, so he asked Jesus, um, who's my neighbor? And then that's where Jesus tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, the lawyer wasn't so much interested um, in wanting to know what it meant to love his neighbor. He wanted to figure out who his neighbor was and limit it so that he could keep the law to love his neighbor rather than simply loving his neighbor. At the end of the story um, of the Good Samaritan, it's the Samaritan who's the, who's the neighbor uh, the, the good neighbor because he had mercy upon the one who was hurt. Uh, loving your neighbor is not so much trying to figure out um, who your neighbor is so you can keep a law. Loving your neighbor is about having a heart that's full of mercy and compassion. When we come to the uh, uh, letters of Paul, Paul as he gives instructions to um, his readers, he calls for them to, uh, at, at the very head, he, he, he calls for them to walk in love and then after he says walk in love that's where, he, that's where he starts talking about husbands and wives and children and slaves and obedience and all that sort of thing but it begins with love our author is going to say in Hebrews chapter 10 he's going to talk about, his, about how his readers once had compassion but now they're starting to, to drift I, I think that 1 John 1 7 and following uh, says, it, says it very well here's, here's what John says he says, I'm not giving you a new commandment, but an old one that you've heard from the beginning. Yet, I am writing to you a new commandment. And he tells us what that com new commandment is in 1 John 3. He says that we should love one another. That's an old commandment. We find it in the law of Moses. Yet, John says it's a new commandment, and it's new in this way. It's no longer a commandment that's written on a page somewhere external to us. It's written on our heart. Once we're free from the yoke of the law of Moses, we're free to, to love one another, we're free to forgive one another, uh, forgive those who have sinned against us, to love the unlovely, because we know what it is to be that unlovely sinner. That's who we once were. With Christ as our new high priest, there comes a new kind of law, one that's written on our heart and in our minds that leads us to love the Lord and to love one another. Thank you.